This video is for entertainment purposes only. I'm not a financial advisor. Never advise you buy, sell, trade, or hodl any cryptocurrency. Always consult with your own financial advisor before making any investing decisions. And everything you hear, see, or read on this channel should just be taken as none of this is a fact. Nothing. Nothing stated in this video is a fact. You always need to consult with your own minister of truth, something like that. <laughs> Don't take anything I say as a fact. Do your own research. Lots of misinformation out there. Whatever I got to say to make you do your own research, that's what I'm saying right here. What up, AE? Good to see you. G, what up? Shadows85, what up? Uh, Jom, what up? Am I saying that right? Jom? J-O-M? Jom, what up? Dubak? Dubek? Jom Dubek, what up, man? Mark my KDA. Abolished in the house. Dgen, what up? Shadows85, Crypto Junkie in the house. How y'all feeling today? Call me a newbie. Do tell. <laughs> what up, y'all? How's everybody doing today? Dan down under in the house. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. What up, y'all? Where are you guys from? How's this? How is this news looking to people outside of the U.S.? You know, how are you guys feeling about this? Hey, what up? Super, what up? What up? Craig Andrews, what up, man? You should check out Died Sandy. Sent you a link trailer to your DMs. Can you show the squad? Uh, is it a pro like certain things I can't pull up on here. So some I try to like do my best to vet the links you guys send me. Do you send it over on Twitter? Damn, that's goofy. Somebody sent me. Is there a Bitcoin Magazine post that's taken down? Sorry, the tweet has been deleted. What did Bitcoin Magazine delete? Yeah, this is live. What up? Nicker Steel in the house. What's going on, homie? Love Indica. NJP, what up? <laughs> vegan. Vegan P-Hub in the Bahamas, no doubt. I feel very safe in cold storage. Definitely the way to go, man. RPM in the house. What up? Crypto Junkie. Yeah, it's a rumble combo. I can't, I can't have that combo on here, homie. Sorry, buddy. Oh, sweet. Yeah. One hitter. Thank you, homie. Or uh, 619. Yeah. Uh, let me. Uh... Yo, Tori, what up? Thomas, what up? Sorry, guys. I thought you guys were on my main screen. I'm trying to go through here on the Twitters and... Uh... Holy, what's all set up all of your appearances? What's a good email address for her to reach you at? Oh, thanks, homie. All right, let's see what else we got on here. So lots of craziness going on. Let's facts speak out loud. Uh, parent infringement suits addressing majority revenues. Yeah, man, there's crazy. If you guys got any good breaking stories that are already on YouTube that we can check out, uh, I'll pull them up here. Oh, this Glenn block, this Glenn Beck has a good one over here. It looks like let's check this out for a second. If you guys have already saw this, let me know if it's worth, uh, worth tapping into, or if I should jump to a certain part in it, it's a long one. It's like an hour one. So 
So this is the the real story behind the FTX scandal. This is Marty Bent, uh, the Glenn Beck podcast. Is a significant threat to the globalist vision of our financial future. This vision is something that progressives have only been able to dream about in the past. But technology has caught up to their wildest fantasies of control. They envision a near-term future in which the greatest means of control over you, your money, can be turned on and off like a tap. When your money is fully digitized under government control, every transaction, no matter how small it will be, will be monitored and logged. And if you say the wrong thing, support the wrong cause, associate with the wrong person or group, you will be brought back in line when the access to your own money is denied. My guest is a threat to this progressive globalist design because he dares to believe in the fundamental American view that individual freedom is a good thing. He has this crazy notion that you should be able to control your own money, that money in a way is speech. He is a threat to their design because his whole career has been devoted to building a way to maintain financial freedom in the face of governments drunk on power and control. He believes the best way to do this is Bitcoin. To that end, he founded TFTC.io, a media company focused on Bitcoin and freedom in the digital age. He's a partner at 1031, a leading investment platform focused exclusively on investing in the Bitcoin ecosystem. He is also the host of Tales from the Crypt and the co-host of Rabbit Hole Recap, both podcasts about what else? Bitcoin. In a world barreling towards more centralized financial control, all of this work in Bitcoin makes Marty Bent a radical. And as you'll hear... He's just fine with that. Today, please welcome my podcast guest, Marty Bent. We begin in just a minute. First, let me ask you, how long did you dream about owning a home before? Glad to be here, Glenn. Thank you for having me. You bet. You bet. Um, I want to start with news of the day, the the FTX scandal. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I don't know anything about them. Just looking at the CEO of the hedge fund who looks like she's about 12 and sounds <laughs> like she's 12 and, and him, uh, wow, these don't, these people don't instill confidence, but they, people loved them. And a lot of really smart people got behind them. Yeah. It's astonishing. Uh, Sam Bankman freed SBF as he's commonly referred to has become this character. Yeah. Uh, a wonderkin that is going to be the next trillionaire. Uh, and it seems that he was just running a big fraud, a Ponzi scheme in the literal sense for, right. for many years. I've been uh, suspicious of SBF and FTX specifically for a bit over a year now. Their whole origin story is a bit odd. And that starts with Alameda, the, the trading company. Right. And then FTX spun out of that. So the trading company is like a hedge fund, right? Yes. Okay. So it's a hedge fund and his girlfriend runs the hedge. I mean, it's just like all kinds of flares go up immediately. Wait, your girlfriend is running that one. Mm-hmm. Um, and they ran into trouble, right? And took Bitcoins from FTX? Uh, they didn't take Bitcoins, but they took. So in... A big theme in the broader cryptocurrency space, particularly the exchange world, is these exchanges will launch what they call an exchange token. Binance has BNB, uh, FTX has FTT, which was FTX token. Uh, And the idea behind these exchange tokens, I think it's a bit scammy. It doesn't really make sense from first principles, but the idea is uh, they pre-mine a token, um, I believe, in... FTT's case, a couple hundred million of these FTT tokens. And what they'll do is they'll release that to their users and their users can buy that token and use it as a piece of equity in the exchange overall, getting some revenues from the trading revenues as well. Wow, Um, that sounds like a scam. Yes, it is a massive scam in my opinion. But the mechanics of these exchange tokens a lot of the time is they'll pre-mine them and they'll only uh, release a certain amount to market 
to freely float and then they'll hold the rest so they're able to inflate the value mm -hmm. of those tokens pretty easily with some spoof trading and it seems like that is what ftx did uh is they launched this ftt token and then they kept a lot off market gave a lot to alameda and then alameda was using that token as collateral to get out loans of better money like dollars and Bitcoin. oh my gosh yes <laughs> that just i i know there's you know it's an unregulated space but that seems like just common sense yes and would be regulated any place else wouldn't would it not yeah it's it's an overt unregistered security yeah. okay um so um they were playing money uh, playing games with tokens he's supposedly uh, you know some philanthropist that really do you buy into any of that no i, I mean i i don't Dis I, I don't not believe that he believes he's a philanthropist, but um, from what I understand, he's very heavily influenced by the effective altruism movement headed by William McCaskill. Out of Which Oxford. is what? Uh, it's this, it's an extension of utilitarianism. And <laughs> these people believe that uh, they are the smartest people on the planet and they can identify where humanity has the most pressing needs and the whole idea of effective altruism is to get as rich as possible, identify uh, the problems that exist that they believe are most pressing, and then allocate as much capital there. Uh, but when you dig into the underlying philosophy and some of the trade-offs they're, they're willing to make, it does uh, begin to get a bit evil. Ends justify the means? Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, uh, he was a huge donor, promised a billion dollars to mm -hmm. the Democrats, uh, if Trump was going to win, he was supposed to donate, I don't remember, 300 million this cycle. And then the next cycle, he would donate the rest. Obviously never happened. Um, mm -hmm. kind of trying to remember 30 million, 30, yeah, 30 million, right? Or billion. I remember when, 30. remember when a million <laughs> used to be a lot of money. <laughs> Soon we're going to be saying trillions. Yeah, in this I context. know. I know. So he donated that money. Um, Everybody was with him. Um, w was this another hedge? I wouldn't be surprised. Um, there's an odd history, not only with Sam and the Democratic Party and Gary Gensler, uh, and it seems like for the last year, two years, he's been trying to buddy up with people in D.C. to develop a regulatory moat for FTX and what he's doing and potentially um, get through some loopholes as is um, coming to the fore, particularly with Gary Gensler. Uh, but yes, it seems that like he is trying to use his money or his user's money to, to get influence in DC to protect himself. And that's one of the big things of the last year he's really been posturing like hey we need to regulate this space and only exchanges like mine should be able to operate do you have any idea on his on his ledger i think it, it just said trump uh trump to lose. stop trump or trump to lose yes. what, what is that do you know i don't know for certain uh however ftx uh, during the 2020 election the lead up to that election they launched a prediction market for the election where you could bet on the outcome of the election and the uh, story first. basically you, you vote Trump win, tr Trump lose or Biden win, Biden lose and you, you place your bets there. And those, those were the names of the tokens. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to this Trump to lose position is a bit odd because it seems like he may potentially, we don't know for sure, but he may be developing that position before the 2024 election wow. even begins. Wow. Um, uh, when I see somebody want their company to be regulated, I'm immediately suspicious. Mm -hmm. I have never, and I'm an entrepreneur, I've never at any time said, you know, it would be really great is if we could get more government regulation in our building. <laughs> That's insane. He was actually wanting to centralize mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin and uh, and its its uh, usage, right? Yes. Well, actually, which is interesting here, uh, SBF Sam is not a fan of Bitcoin, so he wanted you know, what he really cared about was regulating the casino. Again, I think there needs to be a clear distinction between Bitcoin 
in the rest of the cryptocurrency space. I, okay. I, I truly believe Bitcoin is the signal and all the altcoins uh, are simply forms of scenery that these people use to gamble and try to develop war chest. Uh, basically. Explain for people who don't know the difference between the altcoins and Bitcoin. Uh, many differences. Uh, I guess we'll start from first principles. I would argue that. Yo, Antonio, four months, homie. Show some appreciation for RM's channel. Hit that like button, buddy. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you guys big time. Thank you. Bitcoin, it had somewhat of an immaculate uh, inception where it's not going to be able to be replicated. So once Bitcoin was launched, that was a pretty incredible feat that Satoshi Nakamoto brought to the world. Uh, and then as Bitcoin became popular, people saw, hey, Bitcoin's um, gaining in value. Maybe we should launch our own. It is open source code. We can fork mm -hmm. the code and create our own tokens. Um, I would argue that Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency we're going to have a pure launch and actually be like a free market development. Everything after that has a lot of attention. People know when it's going to be launched and they can essentially game when uh, the system when that coin is launched. Mm. But even going from there, if these, if Bitcoin is going to be successful, if any other cryptocurrency that's claiming to be the next Bitcoin is going to be successful, they have to be sufficiently decentralized at the base layer. And it is glaringly obvious to me that there is no altcoin that compares to Bitcoin in terms of decentralization. The amount of individuals who are running the software verifying transactions on their own, not depending on a third party, the amount of mining computers that are spread geographically throughout the planet, uh, the amount of wallet software that's been developed uh, in the space really sets Bitcoin apart from these alternative currencies. But these altcoins, what uh, people promise is, hey, we're going to give you the next Bitcoin. But time and time again, through these cycles throughout the decade, they just turn out to be pump and dumps. So, um he was he was for the altcoins yes so he, he runs an exchange that really makes most of their money by allowing people to speculate on these alternative currencies they can speculate on bitcoin as well but the majority of his revenues are probably driven by speculation on on these different cryptocurrencies so tell me like tell me the difference between them and like coinbase uh not much other than coin all right, so I, I completely disagree with what he's saying about all altcoins. But I mean, to an extent, they have he's he's right on 99% of them. But to classify and always try to push that narrative, all Bitcoin maxis are doing it. At least this guy's kind of explaining the, the difference between, you know, like what the corruption at the highest level. But I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I can't stand when they just try to make the whole story about altcoins and, and mislead people like that. It's not being sold over and over and over again and leveraged mm -hmm. against something else which would provide a much more stable economy. Yes. And I mean, this goes back to FTX. This is exactly what they were doing. Their users thought that they were holding their Bitcoin, but it turns out they're rehypothecating it to their trading arm that was losing it on crazy leveraged bets. But okay. there's ways, again, with Bitcoin's native properties that you can ensure that your Bitcoin is not being rehypothecated. So, And do we have any proof that Almeida lost any trades? outside of at the very end when all their leverage collateral and FTX collapsed, do we have any proof that Almeida ever lost a trade? Like an actual big trade? Because I, I still don't see any proof of that. Like people keep talking about Almeida lost all these trades, but when you are shorting the market and you have unlimited amount of resources, you cannot lose a trade, period. Especially when they're only using 3X leverage. So until we have proof of that, until somebody shows me trades where Almeida lost, I don't see any. So let, let's talk about... Um, I mean, I remember uh, I went to a Catholic school growing up and we studied the end times and they talked about the, you know, the mark of the beast where you won't be able to buy groceries or do anything. You won't be able to travel unless, you know, that little chip that's in your hand, mm -hmm. you know, is somehow or another scanned before we even had scanners. Uh, and everything I, I look at what's coming between ESG Mm -hmm. and central bank digital currency. I'm not saying it is the mark of the beast, but I'm not not saying that either. That is total and complete control of your life, mm -hmm. and, right? And they, they openly admit it. I'm not sure if you've seen 
the clip from Augustin Karstens, who's the head of the Bank of International Settlements, which many people think is the uh, the biggest boss of all the banking institutions mm-hmm. in the world. He's overtly come out and said that we want a central, uh, central bank digital currency because it will allow us to have complete control over people's money. Mm-hmm. We can drop airdrop money into their accounts. We can take money away. We can institute negative interest rates. We can tell them... Hey, you can only spend this money at this place within this amount of time. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. So that's really what they mean when they say you'll own nothing because you won't really own it. They can take it. No, and that's that's why I'm, again, so passionate about Bitcoin, because you can truly own it. And the the prospects of it not existing, uh, the prospects of the future in a world in which Bitcoin doesn't exist are very gloomy. When the alarm clock goes off in the morning, do you open your eyes and the first thing you think about is pain? What has that? Well, today there was just an announcement that a consortium of commercial banks here in the United States are going to do a trial run with the Federal Reserve for a a digital dollar. I'm not sure if you saw that, but it was literally a couple of hours ago that was announced. Uh, What needs to happen? They need to develop the technical prowess to create the the actual apps that will... um, basically get this into the hands of everyday American citizens, uh, which uh, looking at the history of the government, they're not very tech savvy. So we may have time on our side in that (laughs) regard. Right. But one only has to look to China and their social credit scoring system. It is possible. They have done it. Um, And so uh, essentially all they need to do is get a consumer app. It doesn't even need to be a consumer app. It can, uh, they can integrate with other apps like Twitter or WhatsApp, whatever it may be. They they essentially just need to turn on a switch at the federal reserve where the federal reserve starts handling individual accounts instead of federal reserve. That's the, the, are you familiar with the Hamilton project up in Boston? Uh, I don't, I don't think it was the, the central bank Boston, um, or central uh, or federal reserve Boston. Um, was uh, doing a test of something called something they called the Hamilton Project. It was uh, uh. a central bank coin, uh, and they were testing it with MIT. They Drink say it, it was ready, uh. and it it will require that you don't have a bank account at a regular bank anymore. Your bank is the Federal Reserve, mm-hmm. and you know, hey, come get your come get your Bitcoin because you can spend it now yeah. and turn in your dollars. And your dollars are worth a dollar today. Mm-hmm. You know, a couple of weeks down the road, they might be worth 70 cents and then they're worth nothing. Yeah. Or you can't access them because you said something wrong on Twitter. Uh, why is all the CBDC talk coming out right now? Because every, like, I don't know where you guys live or what country, but in America, everybody's against the central bank digital currency. We even have members in government that are against the central bank digital currency. And we have, we still have the free press here. So they can't cover it up. They can't push whatever media narrative. They can't have social media platforms completely censor it because that's going to get them in even more trouble. So there is no way that a central bank digital currency is allowed and actually functions and gets set up in the United States. The, the, the USA people, whether you're poor, rich, whatever, you are not going to stand for it. There is no way. It's against our constitution. We already had uh, certain states like Texas putting in anti-CB central bank digital currency legislation. So it's literally against our constitution to have have state and bank connected or something like that. I'm no expert at it, but it is definitely against our constitution for central bank currencies to exist. And now you have at this whole timing and everything's coming out and all these scandals are coming out. There's just no way the American people are going to let it happen. It might get put into place for a few seconds, but it'll get shut down here so freaking quick. And it's just fascinating to think that Everybody, every celebrity, every American, everybody knows that this is no good for anybody but the corrupt. And it and and it creates a full totalitarian control. It gives government the ability to stop you because in any country or before before this. Right. If you didn't like the laws in China, you could work hard. You could save up money in dollars. And when you got the chance, you could leave that country. Right. Well, now what what China has been doing with their social credit scores is your neighbors are forced to report on you. You're a reporter, so you have to go report if your neighbor doesn't clean their lawn. And they're making their citizens work for free and do free community service every week to get higher ranking scores. And it's this huge, huge, disgusting, uh, full totalitarian control. I don't know how it gets much worse, but it's 
it's really messed up, guys. Yes. Yeah, it, 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 so that is the model. The Federal Reserve will essentially cut out the commercial banking system. And there's some interesting theories about what's going on with uh, overarching Fed policy uh, and, and why it has been as aggressive as it is. Many people think it's a, a signal from the commercial bank saying, hey, we don't want the CBDC world. Um, hmm. But yeah, essentially, if the CBDC does become uh, a thing and it does become widespread, it, uh, the Federal Reserve will have complete control over everybody's money. It will be digital dollars, um, but those dollars will... Um, a trackable 100%. Oh, yes. And, and you know, if I remember um, during the energy crisis in the 1970s, if your license plate was odd-numbered, you could only buy, yeah. you know, gas. I was telling you guys about this. This is individuals. Yes. You're not essential, so you don't get to buy gas. Oh. And you, you are only going to be allowed to go here, so you can buy just that amount of gas. Hmm. I mean, it's it's... It's down to the individual level, which... Yeah. We saw that you had two stakes last week. That's too many. That's too much carbon emissions. You're not going to be able to buy gas this week. That's how granular they can get with this. Um, when it comes back to vaccines, I mean, they tried to roll it out with yeah. the vaccine passports. I think that was botched a bit, but uh, that was, that was, I believe that was an attempt by them to begin to seed this type of uh, government-run right. app into the populace. So when... You, I'm sure you saw the black mirror with the social credit court score. I remember when I, I first saw that, I knew what was going on in China. And I'm like, don't, 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 don't laugh. They're, they're trying to put this together in China at the time. And now it is here through ESG. And I don't know if you saw, but uh, in the uh, news, I think it came out yesterday. We talked about it this morning on the show. Um, the World Bank is moving into that. And... Uh, Freddie and Fanny are, huh. are now moving into the S part, and they say they'll they'll have another 37 million people that will be able to buy a house, because we won't just look at your score, your credit score. Hmm. There's going to be a score on other things, not defined, other things you can do that don't have anything to do with money or savings or ownership that will raise a score for you. And we'll start to have 37 million new homeowners, which will drive the price of everything through the roof mm -hmm. um, and, and, and control. And control. Oh, not only control, it's just self-censorship. Yeah, control via self-censorship and forcing unnatural actions on people. Or maybe they'll go out of their way. Like, this is what we see in China. People get scored on uh, how good of a neighbor they are. And you'll find people going out of their way to just knock up on people's doors and say nice things so that their social credit score goes up. It's really... It if you guys have not watched my VeChain video, guys, you should definitely check it out. Exactly what he's talking about is in the VeChain video. I'll try to pull it up here really quick. Brought up. Yeah. So what has to happen for it not to go that way? <sighs> I mean, I think first things first, people need to get vocal, very vocal about it, which I'm happy that you are and many others have been is saying, hey, this is a line in the sand that we're not going to cross. This is anti-American. This is look how far along we are on ESG. Mm -hmm. And they're still saying it's a conspiracy theory, even though Vantage score, you can go to their website and you can see it now in practice. Mm -hmm. Where she goes, Oh Young How You is followed. What she buys, how she behaves, is tracked and scored to show how responsible and trustworthy she is. It's called the social credit system. And information collectors like Joe I. Nee are paid to report on their neighbors. Central bank digital currencies could be a digital version of money, a bit like a digital banknote. <laughs> I like it, because they have got a broad concept. Uh, hmm, what if this person's an idiot? Which we think that they are. It's like a digital penny for your digital money box, for your digital shithole that you live in. You will own nothing. You will be happy. What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to the Crypto Bra Right? So let me get, let me get back to this because it gets even better. Let me play that last one again of her social credit score. Oh, did I not put it in there? Did I not put the whole thing in there? Oh, damn, I didn't. Oh, yeah, I did. Here it is. Watch this. 
blockchain technology is being used for. Check this video out. Everywhere she goes, Oh Young Hao Yu is followed. What she buys, how she behaves, is tracked and scored to show how responsible and trustworthy she is. It's called the social credit system, and in one version now being tested. And notice how NBC News is reporting this, right? A mainstream media outlet in the United States is reporting it like this. How absolutely, what an embarrassment and mockery of humans across the world. Like this should be so despised by the mainstream media. They're the ones who are supposed to be holding it down and protecting and, and, and speaking up for the little man who can't speak. And instead they're acting like a little, I don't even want to talk about it. A person's reputation is scored on a scale of 350 to 950. And how you, with a good score of 752, is okay with it. In fact, most people are. It's a mechanism like uh, pushes you to become a better citizen. It's big data. So, so right there, right there, you hear that? And most people are. Yeah, most people that live in a communist country where if she were to say anything but she loved that, dude, she would have been hung, you know, hung out to dry, put on social boards, made fun of. You can't say most people are okay with something when most people cannot give you their honest opinion without being feared of like complete tyranny. Listen to this. It gets worse, guys. It's disgusting. So disgusting. Meets Big Brother, expanding how the government score of 752 is okay with it. In fact, most people are. It's a mechanism like uh, pushes you to become a better citizen. It's big data meets Big Brother, expanding how the government monitors, understands, and ultimately controls its 1.4 billion citizens. Thanks to advances in artificial intelligence and facial recognition, and a web of more than 200 million surveillance cameras. Are people bothered by privacy concerns? We think uh, the lot of camera keep the safety is uh, really good. We can accept it. Companies are experimenting with the algorithms to help the government create the new national social credit system. The government also has pilot projects. In one, citizens are required to do hours of unpaid work to get benefits. And scores are docked for things like littering, a messy yard, gossip, even jaywalking. You guys hear that right there? What are your scores docked for? Things like littering, a messy yard, gossip. Your gossip. You are docked for gossiping. Gosh forbid you speak to somebody. Gosh forbid you have an open conversation with somebody. We're going to dock your, your social credit score. And this is what they think they're going to bring into America? Uh-uh. Not happening. We are the home of the free, land of the brave, and I'll be damned if we put up with this shit. Even jaywalking. Video of offenders is shown on the local news. And information collectors like Joe I. Nee are paid to report on their neighbors. Her quota, 10 entries a month. Like the man who carried a drunk person home. A good deed, she says. Good social credit gets rewarded with perks like cheap loans and travel deals. But a bad score means public shame and worse. Huang Hui Jun lost a court case and didn't pay. Now he's on a government blacklist. I can't buy airplane or train tickets, he says, and the list goes on. Being discredited makes it hard to get a job or put kids in top schools. The social credit system will go nationwide next year, and few here are willing to criticize it. Something that may pose a risk itself for a bad score and the life that comes with it. This is something that I think all Americans and people on a global scale should be speaking about. This and, and what's funny is VeChain seems to be one of the main crypto projects that's using crypto technology in the absolute worst way. Now, I can't confirm or deny that. That's just the research and other people's opinions that I've heard. So do your own research. No facts there. But, you know, this is the stuff that America needs to lead by example. And that's what's happening right now. Fed now is a government version of that. Fed now is done. I mean, it, it has to be done. There is no way Americans are going to let these central bankers print away their life savings, destroy this economy, corrupt politicians, and then just sit back and like let's like let's just pretend like this never happened. No, let's have open conversations and talk about how it happened so it can never happen again. The E and the S, not the G yet. I mean, that is. It's scary, but I actually think ESG is taking a big blow this year, particularly with the yes. European energy crisis. Yes. Um, 
so Germany obviously moved first uh, with their attempts to go to uh, zero carbon, uh, net zero, and they decommissioned a bunch of reliable natural gas, coal, and nuclear power plants in favor of wind and solar. And there's a good argument to be made that uh, what's going on over in Ukraine is only possible because Germany was in such a position of weakness because of their energy policy. Right. I think many people are waking up to that. And then uh, I, I do think people are beginning to get very fed up with the woke capitalism that exists in our world today as well. And um, I do think ESG has taken a blow. And I think um, as people in the media are talking to family members and friends, we need to really lean in to the winds that that freedom has gotten this year and because the overt hypocrisy and overt insanity of esg is being acutely highlighted this last 12 months um uh and then bitcoin is the other way to fix it too That's so cool. people speak out and say we don't want that and uh and bitcoin in the world where the central government you know, it, 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 it's absolutely destined to happen if there's an economic collapse. Mm -hmm. You just reset everything. You close the banks and then you say new currency and it's all digital. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is on the horizon for sure. Um, what happens in that situation with Bitcoin? How can you how would you use it or how could it keep you free? Yeah, well, uh, luckily, Bitcoin's a globally distributed network, so individuals around the world are holding a state of the ledger and of the consensus rules. Um, and so, I mean, Bitcoin, as long as people had internet access, would operate as as advertised, as as designed, um, and it runs parallel to the incumbent system. So if they crash the incumbent financial system, flip the switch on the banks one day, Bitcoin would be perfectly fine. It's running on a completely different network uh, that is run by individuals. And can it be tracked? Uh, there's nuance here. I mean, so Bitcoin um, can be tracked. So the way the ledger works, you have um, these outputs that can be tracked through the ledger, but unless you attach uh, like personal identifying information to that that uh, transaction output, uh, it, you can transact in what's known as a pseudonymous way, where the network has no idea who you are. Uh, the only way people can track you on the network is that they have uh, a connector between your personal information and a particular output that you associated with that. So an example of that is buying on a centralized exchange where you have to do the KYC AML requirements where you have to give them your name, your address, uh -huh. you buy Bitcoin there. And then if you send it to a personal wallet, the exchange essentially assumes like, Hey, I'm going to assume that this address on the network is associated with the information they gave us when they signed up. Crap. Um, so what, wait, cause I, I, I have it in Coinbase. So how would I get it out without marking? So there are, uh, there are, there are tools, uh, that allow you to basically, uh, disconnect your your future spending of bitcoin from uh the historical spending uh, these are collaborative transaction tools known as coin joins uh there's companies like samurai uh, which run uh, a coin join coordinator called whirlpool there's um uh, you have to be uh, no, no offense yes but you have to be either your age or a total incomplete <laughs> geek well i'll make it i'll make it even easier the okay. best way to do that is to work for bitcoin is to spin up an address or spin up a wallet and sell services for Bitcoin directly to somebody who's not going to ask you for your information. Um, so for my website, uh, it's connected to a wallet that I control. Um, when somebody wants to pay me, they spin up an invoice and that invoice is created for my computer uh, with an address that only I know. Um, so in that instance, only the person who pays me and I know that I control that address. And the government hates that because you could wildly understate your income. <laughs> Potentially, yes. <laughs> I'm not that you do. I no, would no, be no. horrified if you, <laughs> no, if you did. We are above board. Uh, yeah. Okay, good news and bad news. F*** out. Again. Satoshi Nakamoto. Okay. Nobody knows where he is, right? Or no. who he is. No. They. She. Nobody knows. Okay. 
has his Bitcoin been touched? No, has uh, has never moved. Is there a possibility he lost his key or forgot his key? <laughs> I think there's many possibilities. Yeah, All right. he could have lost his key. How much? How much? There's 21 million. Yes, there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. About nine, just over 19.2 million have been distributed to the to the network. Okay, today. so it's almost all out. Mm -hmm. When it's all out, then Bitcoin mining stops, right? No, it does not. Um, okay, so, explain explain bit, Bitcoin mining. Uh, so Bitcoin mining, uh, essentially, you have a bunch of individuals around the world who run these very specialized computers, and they're racing uh, to find a special hash that allows them to add a block of transactions to the ledger. Um, when they do that, they get rewarded in Bitcoin. The miner that adds the, the block uh, gets rewarded in Bitcoin. And there's two parts of that reward. Uh, the one that you're alluding to that will eventually get us to 21 million Bitcoin is the subsidy. Um, so right now the subsidy per block is 6.25 Bitcoin. And then the other half of that reward is transaction fees. So when you send Bitcoin, a lot of times you'll attach a transaction fee to it because uh, the availability of the amount of transactions that can get into a block is scarce. And so individual users compete to get in their tr transaction confirmed by attaching a fee to it. So when all 21 million Bitcoin has been dispersed to market, uh, mining will still exist, but the minor revenue will be driven by the fees that are attached to transactions. So is this what they talk about that it has limited capability for real heavy global traffic it takes too much energy and it's going to be a lot slower at some point is that any of that true uh it's it's so not every i told you before we started <laughs> I, that's I a... have just enough information to make me so you... wildly wrong and dangerous so you view <laughs> the protocol layer as a settlement layer where uh, since there's that scarcity of block space and only so many transactions can be included in each block, uh, in the future, when Bitcoin is widely adopted, many believe it will become a settlement layer where large transactions are, are settled. But what you can do with Bitcoin is lock it up in second layers that allow you to transact instantly uh, and very relatively cheaply without having to wait on a transaction to be uh, confirmed at the protocol layer. So the most famous second layer solution right now is Lightning, uh, the Lightning Network. And via the Lightning Network, you can send um, as small as a hundredth of a penny, as small amount as a hundredth of a penny to thousands of dollars over that. And you don't have to uh, wait for something to happen at, at the protocol layer. Why? Isn't the protocol layer, again, forgive me, isn't the... <laughs> I'm trying. To. It's like, you know, it's like talking to a golfer to a guy who's never seen a golf course. Um, in the protocol layer, though, where it is verified, mm -hmm. isn't that the key to Bitcoin that it is? It's it's independently verified. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, the money exists and, you know, you can verify where it is going. Mm -hmm. If you don't verify it, how do you stop false transactions? So with Lightning particularly, what you do is you lock up um, a Bitcoin at the protocol layer and you anchor to that. So you point to that, um, that amount of Bitcoin that you've, you've locked on the Lightning network and that is your verification. And you can only move that amount within what is called a channel. So you open up channels with counterparties, each putting up some Bitcoin that they want to transact freely uh, and cheaply and quickly. Uh, and they always have the verified uh, transaction output that they can point to. Uh, this is, uh, yo, Brian, appreciate you, homie. Thank you, Brian. Said, who is this guy speaking, Ryan? Also, can you send this to Neil? Seems like he's down on his luck. Neil, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what did that Neil guy do? Is he just coming in here? Is he still in here? Did somebody give him the boot? <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Uh, I'll send you the link to this. This is Glenn Beck and... Uh, who is the guy is he talking to? Glenn Beck, podcast, uh, Bitcoin dummies. Uh, Marty uh, Bent. Marty Bent, he does something with Bitcoin. I'll share the link for you guys. Um, and if that's not there, they can't operate or spend <laughs> and receive on the network. So, isn't, guys. 
Oh, man, I'm so sorry. Man, I apologize. We'll this whole weeds. thing is just going to be a bloodbath, ugly. <laughs> um, but isn't Ethereum, doesn't Ethereum have, I thought that's where the Lightning Network came from. Aren't they doing, these other coins are being used, I guess, as a backbone, a spine for something else? Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Ethereum uh, marketed itself out of the gate as the world computer. Um so Bitcoin, comparing Bitcoin to Ethereum, Bitcoin is is slow, dumb, and stupid. It only does a few things, but it does them very well, and it does them in a very distributed and robust manner. Ethereum saw what Bitcoin was doing and said, hey, we want to do more. We want to do complex script, scriptability. We want to make all these applications. We want to uh, make all these other networks using the Ethereum network. Um, which they have done successfully, but in doing so, they made a big trade-off, which is to do all that, it's computationally expensive. It takes a lot of data. And so what we've seen over the last six years since Ethereum launched is the amount of data that is associated with that network has gotten so large that it is nearly impossible for individuals like you and me to run uh, our own nodes at home to make sure that the network is distributed. So while Ethereum and similar networks can do all that cool stuff. At the end of the day, it's all for naught because they're completely centralized. And if the state wanted to come in and flip a switch and say, hey, you guys can't do this anymore, it's becoming relatively trivial for that to happen. Whereas with Bitcoin, you'd have to go around the world, find all the individuals who are running nodes and physically have them unplugged. Explain what a node is. So a node is essentially uh a, a computer that you run that has the rules of bitcoin that allows you to verify that other participants are are acting within the rules of bitcoin so um uh you'd have to shut down the entire internet wouldn't you because you couldn't find the nodes no. or can you no. You, no i mean you can run them behind tour vpn so right that's okay. hard to find um and I think that is the best thing about Bitcoin myself is it, it, it's not going away. No. And do you know with um, even quantum computing, can it <laughs> open? I mean, because the quantum computing, we are so close to being able to hack into anything. Mm-hmm. Um, is this going to change the underlying uh, technology of Bitcoin? Uh, there's been a long, ongoing debate about quantum, uh, and people, particularly the protocol engineers. Were- no, this is this is this is a serious question here, and this one, if you guys don't understand how quantum computing works and how Bitcoin works, let me uh, let me fill you guys in here really quick. So, so what is quantum computing to you guys? Does anybody in here know what quantum computing actually does, or how advanced a quantum computer is, and how vulnerable? Bitcoin would be to quantum computers, right? So what's crazy about quantum computing is the Bitcoin algorithm takes two weeks to adjust, right? So when people start solving blocks, like they put out this basically super complex mathematical problem, you know the answer to it, but you don't know the solution to it. And the, and the math problems are done with letters and numbers. So I could put in one, two, three, four, five. And if I put in one, two, three, four, five into the SHA-256 algorithm, it's going to spit out the same answer. So what what the Bitcoin blockchain does is it gives you the answer and your computer just sits here and puts in one, two, three, four. Oh, nope. One, two, three, four didn't work. So then it tries one, two, three, four, five. Didn't work. Then it tries one, seven, two, seven, six. Doesn't work. And the the computers just sit there and throw random random numbers into this algorithm and they're waiting for a response, right? So the thing with a quantum computer is if you're a computer and you ask another computer a question, the quantum computer instantly knows the answer, right? Instantly knows it. So you, you, you ask the, the miners to solve a problem and the miners just use brute force. They just start randomly submitting answers one by one process of elimination until one of them gets it right. Right. And then they solve the block and then the next block is started. Right. So in a few minute period, if, I mean, you could literally solve they could mine three Bitcoin blocks in 10 minutes. They could, they could mine 100 Bitcoin blocks in 10 minutes. It Just because it's one block every 10 minutes, that's not how the algorithm works. So the thing is, if quantum computers get to a point, they could basically mine insane amounts of Bitcoin. And in theory, 
they could actually use a quantum computer to unlock your private keys, right? Because nobody's been able to brute force private keys before. But if a quantum computer gets so advanced, they could, in theory, brute force in, right? Because of the SHA-256 algorithm. So another selling point to Kadena is Kadena uses the Blake S2 algorithm, which is quantum resistant, which adjusts on a, on a much faster scale. So it'd be a lot harder to get uh, quantum attacked on Kadena. So where it doesn't mean that Bitcoin can't evolve, but at some point we're really going to have to seriously start talking about the question about quantum computing and, and its ability to unlock people's private keys and access your wallets. So if it does get to that point, oh uh, man, we're in real trouble. Uh, but as long as there's still technology out there that is proof of work, that is decentralized, that is scalable, you know, there are options out there to the point where you might even see the point where Bitcoin gets moved onto something like Kadena and stored on Kadena and held on Kadena because it is guaranteed. Uh, you can use Merkle trees and all the, and the whole things all in a decentralized manner. Uh, but that, that is a question that needs to get addressed and people need to start really thinking about, you know, working on Bitcoin seem to think that if quantum did come, there are <clears throat> certain cryptographic libraries that can be ported in to make it quantum resistant. Um, but many of them would also say uh, they don't think it's as close as many others think it is. Okay. That's good news. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, uh, the long term, I mean, I invested in Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, Mark Andreessen said to me just before he opened up uh, Coinbase, mm -hmm. He said, you know much about Bitcoin? I said, no. And he said, you should take 10 grand and just invest in Bitcoin. And uh, I remember leaving his office and my wife said, what, what is the Bitcoin thing? And I said, I don't know. I've looked into it. I, I don't understand it at all. And, uh, and Warren Buffett said, if you don't <laughs> understand it, you shouldn't invest in it. And I, it was a fraction of a penny at the time. I, I wouldn't be here at this table <laughs> if I had done that. Um, uh, but, you know, when I did buy it, uh, my wife and I just said, let's just take money that, you know, we're fine losing mm -hmm. and just put it in and then just hold it. Because who knows? It was the closest thing I could think of as what it would be like if you would have invested with Alexander Graham Bell. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a game-changing uh, idea and it doesn't come very often do you think it still has the future with all the stuff that's going on with the government now do you still think it has the future of a hundred thousand two hundred thousand dollars a coin oh uh, yes certainly i mean i'm not going to try and predict when that will happen yeah, but yeah. i think Here, here's what i'm here's what i'm wondering because i keep watching it go down and I, I mean, we've made a pact where we weren't going to sell any of it. Just hold it. Um, and uh, as I'm watching it go down and I see what the government is doing, you could see a future where it's just over or not. I don't think so. No. Why? Uh, there's too many. Because Bitcoin provides a step function improvement on utility of money from an asset perspective where it's very scarce it's better money than the dollar which is being mm -hmm. inflated away mm -hmm. um it's better money than the bolivar it's better money than pesos so uh from the aspects of a monetary good it's just objectively superior in terms of the qualities it's scarcer more saleable more divisible uh you can verify it very easily um so it's better there and then the network the peer-to-peer -peer network uh, allows you to transact uh, directly with the counterpart. So a, l a lot of the use cases that we've seen to date in Bitcoin uh, happen with remittances in emerging markets. A lot of emerging markets that are sanctioned from the U.S., like Venezuela, Cuba, uh, mm -hmm. Iran, other areas where you have individuals who uh, who don't really like their government either, but they're they are uh they are punished because we have this just overarching sanctions that that really restrict them from sending money back to their family members bitcoin has allowed them to do that for the last 13 years and the activity in that particular use case with remittances has never gone away it's only increased and so that inherent utility uh in one use case being being able to send money back home to family members isn't going away and it is bitcoin is the only network that allows these people to do that and then. How, how come um, uh, how come it didn't take off like when Venezuela? I mean, you would, that was the perfect case mm -hmm. 
for Bitcoin to come in and just say, yeah, forget the fiat. We're going here. But why didn't it take off? Dude, that's a really good point that he just made there, right? People should be looking into FTX's order books and Almeida's order books and seeing exactly what they were doing when that big scam wick happened on Bitcoin during El Salvador Day, during Bitcoin Day. Oh, wow. That's a very interesting angle. I hope somebody comes up with more data on that. No, uh, it's like you like you said, this is like an Alexander Graham Bell like uh, invention. Uh, it's so foreign to individuals all across the world. It's a new monetary good and new monetary goods just don't show up once a decade, once every year, once, right. once every half century. They happen once every millennia, uh, arguably. And so well, we're in the early, early stage of Bitcoin where humanity is simply getting comfortable with what it is, how it works, how individuals can interact with it. And that's one thing I tell people is everybody says, hey, how come Bitcoin's not, if it is the best money, if it does right. have the best properties, how come not everybody's using it? Well, I go and go back and say, you don't, you just don't monetize a new monetary good over the course of a decade. Right. It's probably going to take longer than that. And during its monetization phase, you're going to see a lot of price volatility, which right. scares people. And that volatility will scare people. But uh, if you pay attention for long enough, you'll see that that volatility leads up into the right. And with every boom and bust, what you see is, is more people um, uh, basically setting the floor after after every bust. So more and more people are beginning to realize the, the inherent fundamental value and utility that it provides during all these cycles. I do think at some point in the future, there will be a tipping point where everybody realizes like, oh, this isn't going away and right. this is better. We just have to I have to tell that. you, I mean, the, the central banks over in Asia and Russia, they're all buying gold, mm -hmm. all of them, tons and tons. We're selling ours. I mean, that seems brilliant. Um, if, if I were the president, I would have taken what money we have and said, gold, Bitcoin mm -hmm. and and let the chips fall where they may. But I wouldn't want centralized control. Is there any country that is that's a that's a decent sized, you know, not a not a rebel country. <laughs> uh, is there any good country that is looking at Bitcoin and saying we're putting our bet here? We're going to use Bitcoin as our currency. Not yet. Um not yet. I, th I think what you're seeing, it's actually more grassroots than that. You're seeing cities, like there's a city in Switzerland, Luongo, they've ado adopted a Bitcoin standard where they're accepting Bitcoin uh, at all the stores there. Obviously, mm. El Salvador has made Bitcoin legal tender and they're trying to integrate it into their economy. But I really don't, uh, I don't think that's going to happen, nor do I think that's wise for a state to just say, hey, we're going to buy Bitcoin. Uh, me Why? personally... Because uh, I, I do think it's it's got to be an emergent grassroots movement where individuals decide it's not thrust on them. Um, and I think that'll actually be better for the long term viability of Bitcoin, uh, mm. where you have individuals uh, getting access to it, whether they're buying it or accepting it for goods and services. Uh, in my mind, that's a much better path. And that actually gives agencies to the individual. The individual shouldn't have to wait for the state to say, all right, we're going to do this. You can do it today. Unfortunately, to. a lot of people are going to. They're going to wait for, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, I mean, they don't understand. It's, it's, it's like everything today. I think it's going to come down to a photo finish on who gets there first. Does the information about slavery mm -hmm. for the rest of you and your family's lifetimes, as far as you can see, does that get to the finish line before, hey, there's a collapse You've got to take this because we're rewriting absolutely everything and everybody's starving. And so you got to go there. I mean, it's 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 going to be close. It's going to be very close. And that, again, that's why I'm so passionate about it. That's why I run the podcast I do. That's why I work at the venture firm. I'm a partner at a venture firm where we're investing in Bitcoin infrastructure. Again, I, I think it's imperative and I'm doing my best personally to build out this network because again, the, the, the prospects of the alternative are extremely scary and people don't like to use the word, but it will be digital slavery. It will be. Yeah, it will be. Um, I mean, I, when I used to run the blaze, um, mainly into the ground, but when I, <laughs> when I ran it, uh, I was all for 
Bitcoin. I was like, let's be the first to take it. Let's let's go. Um, but what is the adoption rate? Because if we're forward thinking, you know, back then and we wouldn't do it, what is the adoption rate for companies? Are they when when will we see this at your grocery store or, you know, you know, big stores? Uh, I think relatively soon. So there's a company, Strike, that has entered a partnership with NCR, which is one of the biggest point of sales right. companies uh, in the United States or in the world. And um, they're working on partnerships with Whole Foods, Wendy's, Walmart. And so hopefully within the next year, you'll have the opportunity to go spend Bitcoin over the Lightning Network at these uh, retailers. Um, and then on top of that, obviously, Jack Dorsey, uh, with Block and Square, he's been a very uh, forward-thinking Bitcoin advocate, and seeing what they've done with Cash App, uh, building kid? out that suite of Bitcoin tools in that app, I would not be surprised if he begins Looks to like it's been going enable back up. those tools for uh, individuals who use the point of sale uh, system as well. Back up to 1583. Um, are you concerned, for instance, like PayPal and what they've done, or what the banking system has done to Kanye? Um, mm-hmm. You you know you'll have strike in between the user and the and the uh, and the store. You have somebody in between there. Are you concerned at all about? No. So the way strikes um, set up with NCR is is they're essentially providing in a back end API that will allow them to accept Bitcoin. Um, but from the user's perspective, I can go. Uh, and spend from a wallet that I control, where um, the the Bitcoin invoice that I'm paying to doesn't really know anything about the the history of my transactions or who I am. It just knows that I'm spending a valid Bitcoin transaction. Okay, that hel- that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I got this question from two different producers, um, and I was surprised because they're both relatively young and they said i i don't know i mean it's just such a renegade thing it definitely is you know that's a sales point for me um but i guess talk about the renegade uh you hear that that people don't want to do it because it's too renegade for them yeah it's scary uh not only is it renegade, but it takes a lot of personal responsibility. And I think we live in a day and age where mm. personal responsibility isn't um, really respected as much as it, as it probably should be. Uh, wow, that's fascinating. That's why it's so freedom. That's so freedom-based. Mm-hmm. You have to have personal responsibility. If you don't have personal responsibility, you don't have freedom. Yep. Yeah. So that's wow. part of it. And then it is renegade. That's why I like it. I mean, I was born in Philadelphia and... I grew up um, going to Catholic school in Philadelphia as well, and um, I always had this um, draw to the Founding Fathers and the story of how this country was founded. And when it comes to Bitcoin, I think <laughs> you think of what the Founding Fathers they fought for. It. They would have loved it. It protects private property rights. It protects freedom of speech because you're able to send it to anybody you want to. There's nothing anybody can do about it. It's sound money. Um, it, it checks all the boxes. And considering how far we've gotten from the original vision the Founding Fathers set forth for our republic, uh, I think Bitcoin uh, is something, if they were alive today, they would be rallying behind as well. When you see companies like um, BlackRock or Goldman <laughs> Sachs, they're going in opposite direction, and yet they open up these trading desks for um, digital currencies. Mm-hmm. Why? What are they? First of all, they, the, the first promise from people who are Bitcoiners said, well, once they open it up and once these places start opening trade where you can get big institutions to put their money, then it's, then it's over. Then it's everywhere. Did any of that happen? And why are they going, BlackRock in particular, why are they going so hard down a... Um, a digital currency road for the government at the same time getting people involved in Bitcoin. Any theory on that? They just want to make money and they can make <laughs> <laughs> if people, if their clients, if their clients want access to Bitcoin, they, okay. they can make money off the, uh, the trading fees. They're going to do that. But I would recommend people do not buy 
their Bitcoin exposure uh, via BlockRock, because that's what we'll be buying is exposure. I doubt they'll allow you to actually take possession of your Bitcoin. Yeah. And when you talk about rehypothecation and paper Bitcoin, I wouldn't be surprised if BlackRock is able to right. not, again, I'm not calling BlackRock and over Ponzi, but FTX uh, right. had people buying Bitcoin. Correct. But uh, it turns out that they were claiming to have 70,000 Bitcoin, but they didn't have any. Isn't paper gold? Kind of like a Ponzi scheme because there's not enough gold yes. in the world to cover all the paper. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, and that's where Bitcoin is an improvement on gold, where it's so much easier to take possession of and verify that right. you have actual Bitcoin, whereas taking possession and saying gold to prove that it's actually gold is much, takes much more time and is much more expensive. What do you say to people that say, yeah, but it's not gold? It's Does, not. It's not gold. No. I know, but there's but they say that it's, it's nothing. Now, this is this is um, Warren Buffett and his partner. I just saw him on CNBC, and he's like, "I don't get it. I wouldn't give a sock for it um, because he says it's nothing. There's no value there." He says, "Yeah, well, he's an idiot. I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's impossible to deny. Again, going back, Bitcoin allows you to do things that are impossible." Uh, in the traditional financial world. So that in and of itself has value. The, the fact that you can send these transactions that you're not allowed to send on PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, the fact that you can save in a currency that's not being debased, that has value compared right. to the traditional system. And then on top of that, there is a connection between energy usage and Bitcoin. You mentioned it earlier, but you have to do work to actually produce Bitcoin. And that takes a lot of energy and electricity in the real world. It's not just being printed out of thin air. There are people taking significant capital and execution risk to, to ensure that Bitcoin is um, producing blocks roughly every 10 minutes. That's one of the big arguments, though, is that it takes so much electricity. It's going to use more. This is a good thing. We need to start rejecting their frame. Uh, energy, love that. Energy consumption, increased energy consumption correlates with human flourishing. I saw you had Alex Epstein on. Yeah, I love him. Uh, yesterday, I believe, and or mm, last week. Yeah, last week, I think. Um, and I think what he's doing um, in terms of trying to change the framing of the the argument is is incredible. Um, and I think that's what beyond Bitcoin we need to do is humanity saying, hey, this this aversion to energy usage increasing is completely asinine. It's anti-human. It's, it's not going to end well for really us. It really is. But it's the, very anti-human. It is. But when you dive into Bitcoin, particularly Bitcoin does use a lot of energy, but you know, when you look at that at the surface, it's like, oh, no, Bitcoin bad. Uh, and I can see how people may think that. But when you dig in, what you'll find, again, going back to individuals taking capital, and execution risk. Bitcoin mining is ruthlessly competitive. It's ruthlessly capitalistic, and miners have to produce a profit on their operations. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, most important input costs on their operation is electricity. So they're highly incentivized to drive that all-in price of electricity down as low as possible. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding over time is that the cheapest energy is energy that would otherwise be wasted or stranded yeah, right and so bitcoin mining is using a lot of energy uh, and it will continue to use more energy however when you look at it uh, bitcoin miners uh, are are like the scavengers who are finding Correct. the inefficiencies throughout the energy that's why sector. It, is it china where they're using it right by the hydroelectric dam they were before they mined uh, they banned it a couple of years ago um, and that was only just because they wanted control of their own central bank yes yeah um, but even though they banned it, there are still miners within China um, that are God bless them. evading the, uh, the bans. Um, you, ha you have a few feelings about the new British prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I believe you said that uh, you described him as a robotic humanoid. Yes. Why? As you just look at him speak, it's, uh, it doesn't seem human the way, uh, the way he presents himself in public. It's... Reminds me a lot of Justin Trudeau and, and a lot of just into down in New Zealand. You, you look at a lot of these people and you, you can tell that they're, they're not really talking. They're, they're reading from a script. They're not really talking from like a place of, of passion or anything. They're, they're humanoids that have been told to go out there and, and read a script about a CBDC or a lockdown or a build back better. And there. It's amazing how I think this is why Donald Trump had to be destroyed um, by by the progressives all over the world. 
because he's he he won't play the game of I'm in everybody's little system. Mm -hmm. You know, he likes the he's he's a renegade. Oh yes, uh, and uh, it's amazing how fast people uh, change or are replaced now. Mm -hmm. If you're not towing the line on all of this stuff, Liz Trust lasted what forty four days. Yeah, yeah, that's that's scary. And again, that's another. I don't want to bring this right back to Bitcoin, but that's uh, like Bitcoin. I think empowers us to get away from these people. Um, didn't didn't Trudeau shut down? Uh, people with Bitcoin, didn't he take? He f went to, so this is why it's important to take possession of your own Bitcoin and hold your own keys. He went to the centralized exchanges, the FTXs of Canada and said, hey, don't let these people move their Bitcoin out of your central, centrally regulated company. Um, whereas any individual who accepted Bitcoin to wallets they controlled during those protests was not affected at all. So if you, if, but if you take it out, I mean, th this one of the, scary things too you move bitcoin or you spend bitcoin tax law is a little kind of fuzzy mm -hmm. a little bit and you're and nothing's really been settled and they're just itching to you know slam people mm -hmm. uh, for bitcoin um is that calming down at all uh, i know senator lummis and i believe hildebrand are working on a bill that would uh create a de minimis spend uh, tax exemption, but no, I think the the capital gains uh, tax law, especially as it pertains to Bitcoin, is is very restrictive to to enabling more people spending it here in the United States specifically. Uh, it's a shame. I think it should change. I think people should be able to spend Bitcoin uh, without the burden of of mm -hmm. having to do capital gains tax. But uh, we do live in a a government that wants complete control over mm -hmm. us under a government that wants complete control. So I don't expect it to happen here anytime soon, but uh, this is why uh, I like to tell people just use Bitcoin as a savings account um, if you need to. And then if you need to spend it desperately, you'll be able to. So if you take it out and you put it in a wallet, you take it out of the system. So you have it. Okay. Are you charged then? No. 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 no Only when there. you spend it. Only when you spend it for another good or service. And yeah. is that all the honor system? I believe so, yes, at this point. That's why they hate it so yeah. very much. Um, you said uh, recently money, energy, food, health care, education, governance, all are being corrupted by men who think they can predict and control the emergent order. The only way out is the misery that exists today uh, is to smash the points of central... What did Mike just say? No way. Like in Brazil now, courts passed that people on the streets protesting can't have kids. Can't have their kids taken from them. What? What? Dude, that's so wrong. Realization and let the emergent order do its job. Explain. I think that's the overarching problem of, of the world today is centralization. A uh, few men trying to control very complex systems, whether it be the Federal Reserve and other central banks controlling money. Mm -hmm. Money should be uh, a free market good that uh, individuals decide on in an emergent form. Government, obviously the federal government here in the United States has gotten to uh, the point at which it's the largest government to ever exist. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of bloat there, and I think... The individuals in D.C. trying to make decisions for people spread all across the country are not fully equipped or would ever be uh, it would ever be possible for them to solve the problems of, of everybody throughout the country. Just from a pure information systems perspective, they're so disconnected from the source of information on the ground across the country that they can never make good decisions. So, well, isn't that why they they say they need CBTCs? Because they we're on modern monetary theory. And the only way I know it's hard not to laugh um, with modern monetary theory. Their theory is we won't have inflation because we will have the ultimate stop buying this mm -hmm. control if they have a central bank. So it's like technology has caught up to their arrogance. Yes, but again, they'll be making central decisions yeah, central decisions on what how to 
react to that information on the ground, those local areas where they're not the best people to make those decisions. The people who have those problems uh, are the best people to make right. those decisions about what they need most urgently and how they want to allocate their capital. Do you, do you research much on AI and AGI, ASI? Uh, not as much as I, I've been falling down the, uh, the, uh, what is it called? I don't even know what it's called, but the, the AI transhuman transhumanism. No, well, I know transhu. I've had Whitney Webb on the show quite a oh, bit. Yeah. We've, She's we've, great. We've dove into the, uh, the transhumanism trend quite a bit. That scares me. Uh, yeah. I think it's pretty it evil. It's very hubristic in my mind. Oh, big time. Yeah. Big time. Um, I, I think the world is, uh, entering a time if you just feel like we should be having more philosophical discussions right yes. now <laughs> you know, like what is life and mm -hmm. how far do we push things and uh what is the purpose and the meaning of man and of life yeah because it's going to actually start mattering very soon oh uh, yeah i mean i think a lot of what we're seeing is what happens when you live in a society that rejects god and i, I think there's I do believe in good and evil, and I think uh, there's a lot of evil out there that is garnering a lot of power these days. Um, it's, um, I mean, evil, I think, by its biblical definition, is the one that makes the choice for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it will tell you how to live where good highly recommends <laughs> but allows you to make those mistakes so you grow without without any kind of um uh personal risk there's no growth no there's no growth no and we live in a in a world where uh, for some reason or another uh, risk is is not not good these days and it's yeah. Or not considered good. I think it's very good. Um, I think. Uh, I, I think it's essential. I mean, there's. Don't get me wrong. As it's happening to me, I want it just to stop. Mm -hmm. But all of the bad things in my life, that's where I've learned the most. It's not in the good times, you know. And it's certainly not if somebody else makes the decision. I can bitch and moan and say. Well, they made the decision. Oh, look what happened, of course. And it just you just become bitter against whatever. The only time that you really learn is when you're failing on a machine that you built mm -hmm. and you're going your way and that and then you're like, "Okay, wait, 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 wait. I think I want to stop some of the pain here. Maybe I should do it this way or that way." We don't there's there's we don't have the telephone without personal risk. No, oh. and that's why I don't think we'll have freedom uh, in the digital age without the risk of going out there and trying to usher in this new monetary system uh, in Bitcoin that, that truly enables people to take risk. I, I mean, particularly in the energy sector, that's one of the places I've been most involved in on the mining side is it's insane the amount of uh, risk that entrepreneurs in the mining sector are taking and the innovation that they're bringing to the world with that risk. One example is uh, Bitcoin mining is being used as a flare mitigation technique on upstream oil and gas wells where in the Bakken down here in Texas, uh, you, the, you, you'll see the famous flares mm -hmm. where since the natural gas doesn't have a pipeline to get the market, Dude, Mike, I'm trying to tweet that right now. I'm trying to share that tweet and it instantly blocks me. It says something went wrong, but pre, but don't fret. Let's give it another shot. I can't even, I can't even post that right now. What is going on? Oh, I could without the link, but if I share a link to that story, it gets shut down. It, uh, they simply light it on fire and waste it. Bitcoin miners have taken capital and execution risk to invest in the uh, services wow. that will show up and reduce that flare and use it, that gas, run it through a generator, mine Bitcoin. See, that is something a centralized government will never come up with. Uh, is, I like to sometimes I like to describe Bitcoin as digital gulch, uh, gulch mm. where you can simply John Galt. Yes, yeah, yeah. Galt's gulch. It's. Uh, that's the beauty of Bitcoin. It's open source. You don't have to wait 
for permission from the government to do something. You don't have to get a permit. You don't have to get a license. It you drives can, me nuts. You can just show up and start building, and it's fun. It's invigorating. I, uh, you know, I talk to um, I talk to people overseas, and uh, and they'll come over here, and I'll be like, you 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 have no idea. This is not. Do you know what that's gonna do when they try to do that to a parent? Oh my gosh, it's going to be light out for them. I mean, that's the most disturbing, most sickening, disgusting, like every country in the world should be backing them up. And instead we're over here playing politics about stuff that doesn't even matter about what Kim Kardashian, if Kim Kardashian's turd had a few pieces of corn in it last night is making headline news, but gosh, damn it, man. This is so messed up, man. I want to, I want to, I wish I had the ability to put, make my voice louder guys. I really do. Not America. <laughs> and they still say, are you kidding me? This is still much better than any place in the world. But when did we become this group of people that, uh, waited for permission? Mm -hmm. I, it used to be, really, you don't think I can? Okay, <laughs> I'll show you. You know, that's been the main driver in my life. You tell me I can't do something, I've pretty much guaranteed that I'm at least going to attempt it, you know? Yeah. Um, and we're not that anymore. I've it's, seen a lot of that in Bitcoin. It's uh, it's good. It's, uh, it's like the digital wildcatters. There's, uh, there's like a great frontier. And that's the beauty of it too. It's in the digital space. You can build software. And yeah. It's due to the mining, it's uh, in, in meat space in the physical world as well. There's so many things to build. There's so many efficiencies to be gained. And what we're finding is by becoming more efficient in our Bitcoin operations, we're actually creating efficiencies uh, in other parts of the economy, uh, whether it be payments, energy, yeah, um, uh, accounting. I remember 10, 15 years ago, I went to Silicon Valley, and it was the most exciting time. You know, you, you go there, and it felt like Wild West America. It felt like anything was possible. And uh, it concerned me because a lot of the companies were very, very leftist. And they kept saying to me, no, no, no. We don't like big government just like everybody else. We're, no, we're, we're very libertarian in our approach. I'm like, uh-huh. And now it's just one with big government. Yeah. You feel the wildcatters oh. are not. No. Well, no, I, I mean, right now, certainly not. Um, individual, there's a lot of individuals like myself who um, are into Bitcoin because they don't like what the government has done to our money or freedom. Um, that's the other thing, again, going back to Bitcoin being a globally distributed network where and seeing a lot of traction in emerging markets, even if we were to become, or the U.S. government was to become overbearing in terms mm -hmm. of regulations and things like that, Bitcoin would survive. Americans. See, Joanna says, as well as it seems, uh, as well as it seems, most people don't want to think. This is a huge problem. So many people just want to be told what to do and indulge in whatever uh, they are given, no matter how small. See, Joanna, I think a lot of this stems back from the thing, the fact that pe like people want to, People want to think, but literally we are forced to work so hard, so long, so fast that like you literally have to have me in it in, in your earbuds. It's not like you get off work and you get a couple hours to relax and enjoy life. It's like it's gotten so bad that people don't even have time to think. And that's really what they want. Like I, I was watching the media, like a few of these uh, uh, CNBC reporters and they were t they were having they're talking back and forth and they're like, yeah, I mean, who even really watches the news? People are so busy, they don't even have time to watch the news. And I think that's more so where this world's going. It's like, they don't want you to even have time to think for yourself. You have to be so focused on just making money just so you can get by and scrape by and put a roof over your kid's head that I think a lot more people actually want to think, people want to educate themselves, but they're just so trapped in the rat race that there's no way to get out of it. Just wouldn't be able to reap uh, the full benefits of Bitcoin right. because of their government. Right. And then you get into the concept of jurisdictional arbitrage, where at some point, if the government becomes too overbearing and we see all these people in other parts of the world reaping the benefits of Bitcoin and we're saying, how come we can't do that? You, you have one of two options. People either get up and leave and you lose your tax base or uh, it forces changes for the government to say, OK, you guys obviously want to be more like these people over here. So we'll readjust.
um, our priors and, and let you experiment with this and use it freely. Most likely they'll regret not building the wall at this <laughs> time because we'll all be trying to crawl <laughs> over it the other way. Marty. Uh, they'll regret putting the wall up because we'll all be trying to climb over it the other way. I mean, this is crazy, guys. I've never in my life ever would have imagined anything like this would be happening in the United States. Jeez, oh, Pete, what, how is it that, how is it that that info is getting blocked? You know, how is it that no media outlets are covering it? You know, it's so, it's so scary to think that like, that is something what's going on over there should be something that should be mainstream news on every channel, especially in America where we support freedom, we support democracy. And when you have somebody that couldn't even get a few hundred people or a few thousand people to show up to a rally and you have somebody that could get a million people, literally over a million people, hundreds of thousands for sure to show up to a rally. And then you see an entire country with more people than, than what voted for somebody showing up to rally and support. It doesn't make sense. It, I mean, on any scale, no matter how you look at it, it doesn't make sense. And, and seeing that the lack of media coverage, seeing it being suppressed when you search Google, you can't even find anything about it. I mean, that something has to change guys. Something literally has to change and it has to change. Like, I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it and I'm stealing this one from Tucker, but there is something not right out there. Like we all know it, we're watching it. We can see the powers that be playing from both, both sides of the aisle. Like we know things are corrupt, things aren't working, but, but what is it? We don't really know. We don't really know how bad it is, but every day it's getting worse and worse. And every day it's becoming more and more obvious, you know? And I think people are just literally getting fed up with it. We want free press, we want free speech, and we want trustworthy and transparent accountability. It's, it's not that hard. We act like we're in the stone ages and we don't have the technology and the ability to make things better for everybody at least in the United States. I know there's other governments that are a lot more corrupt and a lot more centralized and a lot more uh, 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 totalitarian where the United States actually has a chance. And if the United States fails at this right here, right now, it's, it's done so for the world, pretty much. I mean, it's, I don't think it gets ever more to a point like right now where this is it, guys. This is the line that's getting drawn in the sand and it's going to come out to like is is truth is democracy is transparency is trust is freedom is hope going to win or is it going to be the one world government i don't think there's really another outcome of this it's either people are so sick of the the radical woke left-sided agenda pushing this crazy the the cra like cbc cbs had to leave twitter because they can't report good news like they 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 can't even report accurate honest news without getting fact checked and if they can't spread false news and you can't report on like nobody wants to hear your reports on the on the crap garbage news that nobody wants to talk about. And what everybody's talking about is major political issues and corruption in the government at the highest level. And, and if you can't report on that, nobody wants to go see what, you know, Barbara Streisand ate for lunch last week, you know. So I always get my, I always get myself talking and then I'm, and I'm like, dude, shut up, bro. Shut up, shut up. So then I just kind of like fade out of it, but I really want to tell you guys how I really feel, but I I'm having to be so censored right now and so filtered because I can't say what I'm thinking. Yeah. They actually tried killing cow. Uh, they ca they tried killing meat productions because of cow farts. Oh my gosh! Like that is the biggest. Like that's how you know when you're trying to regulate a cow fart, right? Out of all the natural disasters and things that make the world a worse place, and private jets, right? The people that are flying their private jets are trying to kill and limit cow farting. Oh, geez, oh, Pete's guys. Oh, dude, yeah, you have both says Bernie was selling out stadiums. Biden couldn't fill a high school gym with supporters. January 6th is getting a little bit more interesting as we start hearing these actual news outlets that actually report the news still 
actually covering stories. Could you imagine what it would look like if Fox didn't cover any of these stories? Like, could you imagine how close we are to that tipping point of no return? <laughs> We're going to start selling uh, boxers with lighters in the pockets, <laughs> with lighters in the butt cheeks so you can burn your farts. <laughs> you got to burn off those farts, guys. You're going to have to go outside and, and pick up three pieces of trash every time you fart. If you don't, your social credit, credit score is getting docked. <laughs> you let one rip up. Oh, that's we're docking your social credit, credit, credit score for that fart. You know, <clears throat> yeah, the collapse LG. There's just certain things I can't cover on YouTube, man. It's so sad. Yeah, how much got into the environment when that pipeline went off? Exactly. I mean, the amount of... The, did they ever fix that, Danny B? Was that ever plugged or is that still just spewing natural gas out into the sea? Yeah, meanwhile, Sam Bankman fried still in the Bahamas in his mansion having poly orgies. Uh, yes, I did, DCF. Dinosaur farts. <laughs> Dino dinosaur farts caused the first ice age. <laughs> Big old T Rex let one rip by a volcano, and that was all she wrote. <laughs> Yeah, undersea polygon says others undersea methane get from volcanoes make <laughs> right like a like me man-made methane look like a drop in the bucket. No DCF. I've covered it. I went through the whole in my uh, tokenomics.